concepts of power. We must live in balance with the earth. And also with recent happenings at Wounded Knee. I am awake. Welcome to Native Roots Radio Presents. I'm awake and I'm your host, Wakanja Hade. Hey, Kadigi, to all my friends and relatives in four directions, you're listening to a special edition of Native Roots Radio Presents. I'm awake and it is now Native Roots Radio uh, Presents Minneapolis Air, which is uh, stands for Minneapolis American Indian Relations. And I want to introduce you to our special guest host tonight. Christine McDonald and Christine really excited to amplify your work and what's happening in the city of Minneapolis. Peeny Gigi, thank you so much for coming on and, and, you know, guest hosting the show. Take it away. Miigwech, Robert. Uh, no, Buju, welcome to Minneapolis Air, American Indian Relations. Ogodaki, Gabawik, Nindijnikaz, Ajijak, Ndindem. I am Christine McDonald. I am the American Indian Community Specialist with the City of Minneapolis. Uh, my background is that I am Anishinaabe and Hunkpapa. I am an enrolled citizen of the Lakuduri Tribe in Wisconsin. I have been with the City of Minneapolis for a little over 25 years. My first 13 years were with the Minneapolis Human Resources Department, um, and then most recently with the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department. So thank you for joining me. Um, thank you for the space, Robert. Um, so with me today, uh, we're gonna talk about this new show and its mission is Karen Moe, who leads the city of Minneapolis Neighborhood and Community Relations Department. Welcome, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> so Karen, what is Neighborhood and Community Relations? Um, Sure. First, thank you for having us on the program today. This is, as our inaugural program, I'm really excited uh, to be here in this space with you and want to uh, start by just saying thank you to Robert and to um, Native Rich Radio. This is a real um, special opportunity for the city of Minneapolis to be partnering with you. Um, I am the Director of Neighborhood and Community Relations. Uh, we often call our department NCR for short because it's a long name. And our department is a small department. It was established about, uh, I think about 12, 13 years ago in the city of Minneapolis. And our role is to connect the community to the city and the city to the community. We do that um, through a variety of ways. First and foremost, we engage all of our communities with a priority towards communities that historically have been under-engaged or unengaged by government. We support our city's network of neighborhood organizations, and we work to ensure access for all residents, um, including people with disabilities and residents who speak limited or no English to city services. Our department also houses the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, which focuses on making sure that our immigrant and refugee neighbors have full access to civic life. Uh, and what is your role in the department? Well, my title is Director of Neighborhood and Community Relations. Um, really, my role on a daily basis is to make sure that um, uh, within the city structure that all city departments and leaders um, understand what value we bring, as well as what are the needs and priorities and wants of all of our residents. I work closely with elected officials to make sure that the information that we hear from our residents comes into the city. Um, I also work with my colleagues in the department, Christine, you being one of them, uh, to make sure that we effectively work with all of our city departments. So make sure that all city staff understand how to effectively engage in ways that are meaningful for all of our residents. Um, along with that, I have a lot of mundane activities, which would just include things like <laughs> making sure our budget uh, gets done, invoices get paid. Uh, request for vacation, get approved, things like that. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so how has the role, how has the city historically supported the American Indian community? Um, this is one that I've, uh, I myself have done a lot of learning. Christine, you've helped me understand as well as many other people um, from community and our elected officials and former elected officials have helped me understand. Um, 
I think one of the primary things I want to point out is your position, the American Indian Community Specialist, actually has existed for over 50 years. And that originated in the mayor's office. That was a commitment on behalf of the city and the mayor at the time to um, create a position really dedicated to our American Indian community to, again, really bring in the concerns and the wants into the highest level um, of government. Um, and over the last 50 decades, that position has changed in terms of how it's been structured and what the priorities are. As I said before, when our department was established a little over a decade ago, that position actually came into our department, Neighborhood and Community Relations, and works with the whole um, group of colleagues. Today, one of the primary responsibilities or one of the primary ways that the city of Minneapolis, our government, uh, this current government entity, works with our American Indian community is through the memorandum of understanding with the American Indian community. Uh, for shorthand, we say MOU. And that is uh, a commitment between the American Indian community and the city of Minneapolis. That's um, implemented through a, uh, a shared agreement with leaders from the American Indian community. This is significant because our city is home to members that represent more than 130 federally recognized tribes. And so this is a significant part of our community. And the way that we work with the American Indian community through the official channels as government is with a group called the Metropolitan Urban Indian Directors. Uh, for shorthand, again, MUD. You know, at government, we like our, our acronyms. Um, MUD is made up of executive leaders from organizations serving the American Indian community. And so that's one of the primary ways that we uh, work with the American Indian community. So can you tell us uh, why the city is coming to Native Roots Radio? Uh, first, I just want to say I'm so excited that we are here. This is really, <laughs> um, uh, on behalf of the city of Minneapolis, I'm excited that this day is happening. Uh, really just a lot of gratitude. Um, one of the main reasons why we're here is um, one of the main goals that our current leadership has is to end disparities and racial inequities. And that really looks at internally, how are we providing services? And one thing we know is that we've been trying to do better and that we have a lot of work to do even better. And um, one of the primary ways is just how do we effectively reach all of our community members? Historically, government entities have used things like written documents, like press releases, um, or putting information on our website. And the intention with this radio program is to reach out to residents where they are at um, and share information on behalf of the city in ways that they are receiving it in meaningful ways. And that includes through this radio program. Um, uh, I'll just point out that this uh, program, our commitment here is to come back out once a month for one hour and bring a variety of, of information um, on behalf of the city that we believe is a priority for our American Indian community. We think um, in terms of looking at what we're gonna be bringing out, some of the topics may include information about upcoming elections, information about public safety. The city has a lot of work going on around public safety and wanna make sure all of our residents understand that, um, as well as very mundane things like how to fix basic problems and um, make sure people know about things like snow emergencies. Hey, I got to just jump in here, and this is uh, Minneapolis Air presented by Native Roots Radio, and uh, I'm joined here by Christine McDonald and her guest, and we're really getting a lot of great information about what the city of Minneapolis does and how it supports everybody on Turtle Island. Hey, this is Native Roots Radio presents I'm Awake and Minneapolis Air. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. Minnesota has the only original wolf population in the continental United States. And 80% of Minnesotans believe the wolf should be protected. Howling for Wolves is asking Minnesotans to respect our true wildlife manager, the wolf. Their survival is critical to our ecosystems, our communities, and even our economy. 
As highly intelligent animals with strong social bonds, Minnesota wolves deserve to be protected and admired. Learn more at howlingforwolves.org. Let's, Let's live, live and, and let howl. howl. The city of Minneapolis is now on Native Roots Radio with Minneapolis AIR. AIR stands for American Indian Relations. Host Christine McDonald talks to people about important things affecting the city's Native communities. Minneapolis AIR dives into topics like public safety, public health, elections, and so much more. Tune in to Minneapolis AIR on Native Roots Radio from 5 to 6 p.m. on the second Wednesday of every month, right here on AM 950. As we pack away the ornaments and bid farewell to the holiday season, it's time to unwrap the gift that keeps on giving, getting protected by a COVID-19 vaccination. This is your chance to make a difference, especially as our Native communities face higher COVID numbers. Those higher numbers underscore the need for collective action. So answer the call and get vaccinated. The latest vaccines are not just authorized, but they're proven effective against the current variants. This is extra protection, even if you've already had previous vaccines, since previous vaccines will eventually wear off. Plus, the new shots are FDA approved for ages six months and up. A COVID vaccine is not just a shot. It's a pledge to safeguard the wisdom and stories handed down by our elders. So join the movement, get vaccinated, and make 2024 the healthiest year ever ever securing a brighter future for our Native community. For more information, including details about clinics offering free vaccines, visit vaccines.gov. Anin, I'm Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan, and you are listening to Native Roots Radio. Welcome back to Native Roots Radio presents I'm Awake, and this is Robert Pilot. Hey, I want to welcome everyone back to Native Roots Radio Presents, Minneapolis Air, American Indian Relations, and with our guest host, Christine McDonald. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for listening. And Christine, take it away. This has uh, been really great information and really fun uh, partnering with, uh, with you guys. And we're learning a lot already, Haley and I, right, Haley? Oh, absolutely. Love the city of Minneapolis, even though, even though we're on the other side of the river. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> we joke about that all the time. But thank you, Christine, for being here with us. And uh, you as well, Karen. Thank you. Uh, we can get right back into it. Karen, um, is this the first time the city has done something like this? Um, no, actually, we started a couple of years ago with uh, Spanish language radio. Um, when we had the Super Bowl, we were looking to uh, make sure that our Spanish-speaking residents understood what was happening at that time. And we uh, worked to have a program in Spanish, getting information out on La Raza. Since then, we have added a handful of programs, including on KMO, KMOJ, um, in language, in Hmong, Somali, and Oromo. Thank you. Can you talk about why the city chose the name Minneapolis Air, American Indian Relations? Sure. This is one. Um, we've had a lot of conversations in our department uh, and uh, collectively we do a lot of learning on a regular basis around um, terminology and how we refer to people. And um, AIR stands for American Indian Relations. And what, uh, what we understand is how community and how individuals want to be identified is really an individual preference. Um, per your advice, Christine, as the community engagement specialist for our American Indian community, we tend to use the term American Indian based on historical relationship, the historical relationship between our current form of government and the first indigenous people of our nation. Um, we know people use all different terminology, but uh, some of the examples that we've looked at in terms of us working for our current form of government is things like Bureau of Indian Affairs, Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, Metropolitan Urban Indian Directors. And so out of respect for who we are uh, and with our relationships with community, we um, landed on the term American Indian Relations. Yeah, thank you. I know it's complex. We use it interchangeably, Native and Indian, American Indian, Indigenous, First Nations. Um, what do you see as talking about a Minneapolis Air? Like what's going on at the city that Native Roots listeners would want to or need to hear about? Hopefully there's something 
for everyone. <laughs> um, we're only going to be on once a month. So it'll be, um, we'll have to limit what we can come on with. But uh, what we're going to try to do is focus on programs and services from the city of Minneapolis that we believe would be important and significant for our American Indian community and our residents. Um, for example, I think um, today we have an exciting lineup. Um, following uh, this segment, we have Hyde uh, coming on, who is our the city of Minneapolis's first ever poet laureate. Um, but we also have other exciting programs constantly happening, and we're hoping that uh, we make sure we bring those programs on um, so that all of our residents have access to those programs. In addition, we always have some ongoing and, and just regular news that we really want to make sure people have access to. Um, some of the things coming up, I think, in the immediate future, we're already thinking about the budget and what the budget process looks like and want to make sure people's voices are heard in the budget process. Um, we also have a big election this year and the city of Minneapolis manages elections um, and want to make sure that everyone in our community takes advantage and knows how to take advantage of having their voice heard in the election process. We also have, um, uh, I'm sure everyone is aware, quite a bit of work in front of us regarding um, the city's relationship with our community around community safety and relationships with our police department. And so we'll be coming on, hopefully bringing some um, folks from other departments talking about the settlement agreement with the State Department of Human Rights and other work that's moving forward and make sure people understand what's happening and also how they can have their voice heard in city's decision-making process. I think next week uh, or next month, I do want to say um, uh, the on February 17th, the city will host its annual Community Connections Conference. This is a free event. Um, for all residents. There's workshops, speakers, panel discussions, and exhibits. There's also free food. We usually have pretty good food. Um, and uh, it's a great opportunity to come and meet the people behind the city departments. And so I think we're going to have someone come on in February to talk a little bit more about that conference. So hopefully, again, there's something for everybody. Are there any other things NCR would like our listeners to know about? Well, since I have the opportunity here on behalf of my department, I will highlight a couple other things um, specifically from neighborhood and community relations. Um, we uh, have the honor of um, managing a program called the Partnership Engagement Fund. This is a million dollars that is distributed out to community led efforts, working on issues that are priorities within those communities. It's a um, annual process, so you do have to apply if you're interested in accessing some of those funds. Um, but that uh, really is designed as a way for community members to let us know what's a priority for them and what do they think are solutions for those. And we just offer the opportunity to support them through the, the funding. And so that's something you could go to our website to learn a little bit more about. Um, as I mentioned before, we also have the community connections uh, coming up. Uh, February 17th at the Minneapolis Convention Center. Um, and yeah, I think um, I think those are some of the big things coming up from our department right now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, do you uh, do you want to give any information about our neighborhood organizations and how we work with those organizations and how maybe folks can get involved? Sure, we um, at the city of Minneapolis, I won't um, just on this side of the river, I'll, I'll say that we, I think on the other side, it might be true as well. Uh, we have a vibrant um, neighborhood organization network. Um, uh, Christine and your colleagues, you work uh, with people really based on um, kind of their identity and who they are. Um, but our neighborhood organizations work to engage people at the very local level based off of their geographic area, right? So mm -hmm. where you live, every neighborhood in the city of Minneapolis. So every resident in the city of Minneapolis has a locally designated neighborhood organization. We work with them to fund very similar to the partnership engagement fund, 
Um, we fund them to engage their residents at the very local level. And those organizations work again to identify what are their priorities for that community. As we mm-hmm. know, um, depending upon where you go in the city, the issues that are coming up or the interests that are coming up may be very different. Minneapolis is not one whole. It, it actually is made up of many different people and many different neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, and so the neighborhood organizations are funded to really identify and work at that very local level. We would say neighbor to neighbor, block to block, to engage each other, identify what are the air, what are the primary issues or concerns, and then work together to either have their voice heard uh, again in the city decision making process, or to identify the solutions themselves, what makes sense for them. Um, if people are interested in getting involved, again, um, on the city's website, you can access information. If you don't know what your la- local neighborhood organization is, we can. Um, it's on our website. And it, there's also links to all the neighborhood organizations. So you can find out more from those organizations how to get involved. And uh, one thing I will say is I think the city of Minneapolis has a very vibrant um, vibrant network of people at the very local level, you know, working to make our community, making our city as a whole better. And one of the things that we do to support that is, again, the, um, through the neighborhood organizations, as well as the Partnership Engagement Fund, is really that idea of supporting people um, coming together, working together, partnering on solving those problems at the very local level. Yeah. I was really surprised um, myself growing up, born and raised outside Minneapolis. It wasn't until I started working for the city of Minneapolis when I learned about neighborhood organizations. Um, so I think the more that we can push that information out and let people know that there's opportunity there um, mm-hmm. to be involved, um, to uh, seek support when we have issues come up in our community. Um, and the other thing I'd like to point out for my community is that the highest number of American Indians in the city of Minneapolis reside in East Phillips. Um, And I thought I heard somewhere that East Phillips was going to be merging with another neighborhood or were there two neighborhoods that were going to be merging at some point? Um, Yeah. And the first note I'll say, uh, so on that question, I'm not aware that East Phillips is merging. I know that there's some conversations around how at the very local level to work better together. Okay. Um, And there have been a couple conversations. um, I'm not sure with East Phillips, but I just, I do want to add in here. I think East Phillips is a really good example of um, an organization we really do want to connect all of our residents in through those neighborhood organizations, as well as supporting the partnerships between other organizations and neighborhood organizations. To your point, we have a lot of other um, specifically native led organizations in the East Phillips area. So we really want to make sure we lift and raise all of them up. Thank you. Wow. What a great interview. Hey, uh, this is native roots radio presents air Minneapolis air. Uh, American Indian relations, really. Karen, a lot of great information. Christine, great job. Keep up the good work. We got a couple more segments to go. This is Native Ritz Radio presents Minneapolis Air. I didn't know there were 130 recognized tribes right in Minneapolis. That's uh, that's really good information. Hey, we'll be right back after this short break. <laughs> Hey, if you're like a lot of people, you're probably relieved that the holiday celebrations are over. But there's one thing that might stay with us from the holidays besides all those gifts, and that's COVID-19. Numbers from COVID are going up as we spend more time inside. And Native Americans are seeing even bigger case spikes. With all the indoor celebrations over the holidays, you may have unknowingly been exposed to someone with COVID-19. That's why it's important to stay vigilant. If you notice any symptoms like a fever, a tickle in the throat, or heavy fatigue, take an at-home test. They're still free and can be ordered at sayyeshometest.org. If you do test positive, you're eligible for free treatment, and no health insurance is required. Visit health.state.mn.us to connect with providers and receive your treatment. 
Let's make 2024 the healthiest year ever, securing a brighter future for our Native community. Become a teacher and ignite change. Join the St. Paul Urban Residency Program to become a teacher in just 15 months. You can earn your master's degree and teaching license from the University of St. Thomas while earning a $30,000 stipend, single health care, and dental benefits. As an added bonus, next year's cohort, all residents will receive $20,000 towards their tuition. Apply now. Applications due February 28, 2024. Visit spps.org backslash S-U-T-R. Hi, I'm Claudia with Minsure, Minnesota's official health insurance marketplace. With Minsure, you can compare health plans from multiple companies and get free help from a trusted expert. Whatever health plan you choose with Minsure, it's guaranteed to cover essential benefits so you can get the care you need. See if you qualify for discounts available only through Minsure. If you need quality, comprehensive health insurance, get started now at Minsure.org. End-of-life decisions are not easy to make. Hi, I'm Mary T. of Mary T. Hospice Care. It's important to make sure that this difficult time is meaningful and comforting to you and your loved ones. Our hospice team provides an individualized program of physical, emotional, spiritual, and practical care so your loved one is comfortable and not in pain. At Mary T. Hospice, we understand that choosing the right hospice care provider can be overwhelming, but we're here to assist you. Learn more today at MaryTInc.com. Hi, I'm Claudia with Minsure, Minnesota's official health insurance marketplace. With Minsure, you can compare health plans from multiple companies and get free help from a trusted expert. Whatever health plan you choose with Minsure, it's guaranteed to cover essential benefits so you can get the care you need. See if you qualify for discounts available only through Minsure. If you need quality, comprehensive health insurance, get started now at Minsure.org. With your AM 950 weather, I'm Brett Johnson. Look for light snow tonight with a low around 13, Thursday partly sunny with a temp falling to about 12, and Friday cloudy with a high near 18. Experience a delicious dinner out at Nightingale. Indulge in the Nightingale burger, roasted duck breast, and more exciting dishes like the roasted broccoli bruschetta and smoked chicken liver plate. Takeout orders available at your convenience, and Nightingale is open daily 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. with their full menu until midnight. More at NightingaleMPLS.com. Hi, I'm Jane Fonda, and you're listening to Native Roots Radio. And we're back to Native Roots Radio presents I'm Awake, and this is Robert Pilot. Hey, I want to welcome everyone back to Minneapolis Air, presented by Native Roots Radio. We have our guest host and her groovy guest, uh, Christine mcdonald here and she is taking the ball in uh in a good way and running with it thanks uh christine this is really awesome information and i'm sure everyone's really interested everywhere around turtle island so let's uh welcome back again oh me it's robert i'm enjoying being here uh now our next guest for the first time ever the city of minneapolis has a poet laureate hyde e erdrich was just appointed last month Hyde is Ojibwe enrolled at Turtle Mountain. She has received two Minnesota Book Awards, as well as fellowships and awards from the Library of Congress, National Poetry Series, Native Arts and Cultures Foundation, the Loft Literary Center, First Peoples Fund, and others. On Monday, she was honored at the first gathering of the new Minneapolis City Council and presented a new poem written specifically for the occasion. Hyde joins us here today. Thank you so much for coming on the program today, Hyde. Amigwich, Christine. Hyde Erdrich, Dijinikaz, Jaganashimong, Majikwe, Indigo, Makaduk, Wikjuing, Ndunjaba, Minawa, Dakota King, Guy Kabikang, and so I'm Hyde, and I live here in Minneapolis, grew up in North Dakota and near the system Wapton, Oyate, and I'm in Old Turtle Mountain. Thank you. Uh, so I understand that being Poet Laureate isn't just an honorary title. Can you tell us about your duties as the new Minneapolis inaugural Poet Laureate? Well, it, it's really interesting because uh, it's the first Poet Laureate. I'm sort of introducing people to the position and helping uh, understand what it can be. I have events that I'll do, public events for the city government, as well as for the state of Minnesota, if asked. 
and I get to teach some classes at the Loft Literary Center, as well as do a special project. So it's kind of developing as the year goes on, but uh, that's what I know I'll be doing so far. Thank you. Um, so your duty as Minneapolis Poet Laureate is to present two classes through the Loft Literary Center. Can you tell us about your plans for those classes? Yeah, those classes will be based around uh, ekphrastic poetry. That's poetry that looks at visual art. I've spent a lot of my uh, work life working with um, Native American visual artists and others in the Twin Cities. And I find it a huge strength of our city, something that I love to showcase whenever I can and that I love to you know, contribute to in ways that I can. So I am going to teach two classes about writing about visual art, how poetry and visual art intersect and also other arts like choreography um, and how you know, native aesthetic is music and dance and visual art uh, and language all at once. So I hope to bring a little bit of that to my introduction to the role of Poet, poet Laureate. That's amazing. Uh, another aspect of your year as Minneapolis Poet Laureate will be a special project of your choosing. Are you able to tell us more about what that project looks like? Part of becoming the Poet Laureate and being selected for it was that we had to have a plan for what we wanted to do. And I had this overly ambitious plan, but the, I'll boil it down to listening sessions, poetry listening sessions, where I want to work in at least four neighborhoods in the city, probably based on the directions of the city, and listen to what the poets from those communities and other people have to say about their dreams for the city, and how they fit in the city to understand what the poetry is from various communities and to you know, familiarize myself with it so that I can bring it back to the community in a form, probably a short poem film, but a form that could be worked into public art. Oh, that sounds so exciting. Um, I love tying that poem, the poetry into those spaces, because uh, I know in our community, we're not very tied to the brick and mortar of spaces, more into the sense of that location and what that means for us. Um, have you, uh, you brought some of your poetry to share with us today? Yeah, I would love to share the poem, the beginning of a poem that I wrote for the city council meeting the, on Monday. I decided that I would start with a poem that has multiple parts to it. And I will do a different part in each season throughout the year. So it's a poem for the four parts in four parts for the city of Minneapolis. And I'll read you just the first part. Winter. This is the city dreaming in its original language, Dakota home mapped on astronomical planes. So streets still chart the stars Tell us where to be in each season, river at spring equinox, sun up, lake at fall equinox, sundown. This is the city dreaming in winter into the silence of frozen spaces in this bare year, the quiet broken by wishes, calling down the snow, calling for a home. The city makes its own way home, makes its many ways home. This is the city dreaming under cold and deep skies on icy streets moving with care. Winter swallows background noise, makes the perfect place to listen, to hear one another. Snow is just another sign for home. We can laugh at it together, whether we park on the odd side or on the other side, or find our street restricted. We plow on through, we're in it together. When the city dreams in winter, what does it learn? Listen to the city dreaming, calling us home in many languages. Listen to the city dreaming, moving toward a chorus, learning its multiple and singular voice. That is so beautiful. I love that. There's so, many, so much in there that I love, where the, especially where you talk about the streets uh, what was that part about the streets navigate the stars? 
Yeah, I mean, that's one of those things that I noticed living here. And, I, you know, I was told, I lived in St. Paul when I first moved to the Twin Cities, and I was told that a lot of the major roads were old Dakota trails. And one year I was driving down Franklin, headed toward the river, and it was the equinox. And just as the sun popped up, it was right in the middle of the road where you would get to the river. And then later on, I watched to see if it set at the lake side of Franklin in the fall and in, in the fall equinox, and it does. So the, these old roads are part of how Dakota people mapped their place in the universe. And it's such a very important pe place to indigenous people. I, I really want to celebrate that and invite all kinds of people to understand the place they live. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. I um, want to thank you for being here today. It was an honor to be at the council um, when you were presented with your proclamation. Um, and I look forward to working with you and celebrating with you over the next year. Thanks. Um, it's so great. I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, maybe there's a way I can bring some more Native poets onto air. So I look forward to that. As the program is fantastic. This is, this is amazing. Thank you. There is going to be a public celebration of Hyde planned next week. Um, it will be from 6 to 8 p.m. Thursday, January 18th at the Loft Literary Center at 1011 Washington Avenue South in Minneapolis. Miigwech, Hyde. Miigwech. Yeah, thanks. Hyde, before you go, I got a quick question. Um, when you lived in St. Paul, were there any roads in St. Paul? Because I've never heard that about Minneapolis, that uh, were old trails. Uh, that's really okay. interesting. Yeah, um, um Ernie White man told me that Snelling in uh, St. Paul was also an old Dakota trail. And there were many that were mapped in a project, um, which I can't remember the name of right now. But yeah, so uh, both sides of the river. Wow. Um, and two, I don't know if you uh, have anything. We got a couple more minutes left in this segment. I'm wondering if you have any, th any uh, poem you'd like to, to read. Uh, to our listening audience, uh, I hate to put you on the spot, but do you have one handy or you know by heart that you could uh, to uh, to to tell our uh, our audience? Well, I'll take a little look, and while I'm looking, I will say <laughs> something about anybody who can see my avatar. I um, <laughs> I have a portrait that was done by the late great Jim Demony, a very good friend of mine, and it kind of shows my notion of uh, poetry and visual art going together. And uh, I'll read another really short poem that has uh, connections between um, Native culture as being both poetic and visual and, uh, and it concerns dance. And this poem is called Sister Nations. We convene in a long dusk in the lasting corona of twilight in our prairie homelands midsummer. We gather beneath our ancestor dancers, vivid whirling, magnetically arrayed giants or solar flares. However we know them, we remain theirs. Glass blue depth at our backs, we ease lush summer skies, a comfort to us. Three nations of sisters encamped in camp chairs in the dark beyond the dance arena's glare. We thrill together when a bear pushes her way into the circle. Her attitude commands us, her crouched inspection, once round, glancing at everyone in turn, sometimes rushing the crowd. She shakes a warning, claws the air, crosses her paws, then pauses, hunches into the darkness beyond us. Sisters, as her fur brushes past us, dark, warm, soft as this night, her beast breath left a blessing. We gasped and heard her roar, a true bear roar before she threw her animal robe back and laughed her woman's laugh. Wow, beautiful. I love that one. Uh, Haley, do you have any uh, questions before we let this, uh, this our poet laureate of Minneapolis go? That is awesome. I just really love the comparison between the bear and, you know, us as, you know, females and in native communities, um, we're such, you know, matriarch uh, societies and um, yeah, it's just, I think you have very beautiful words and thank you for being here today with us. 
Oh, thank you so much. You know, I um, am such a bear person. I'm Makwa Dodum. So um, I, I call my office the Den of Hyde Bear Nation, and it's really past my, my bear sleep nap time. So thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> We can uh, we can agree with that. <laughs> uh, hi, Heidi. Thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, we have a lot to talk about next segment. Uh, th this has been just a fabulous uh, uh, inaugural show, and what great guests you uh, have picked to to represent uh, uh, this uh, new program that uh, we're we're partnering with. Uh, I'm excited. Let's talk a little bit more. You're listening to Native Roots Radio, Minneapolis Air. And, uh, we will be right back after this short break. <laughs> As we age, it's important to invest in our health and to help protect it. Like the flu, COVID-19 is always changing. That's why it's important to stay up to date on your vaccines. By getting the flu and COVID-19 vaccines, you can renew your body's defenses and lower the risk of getting sick. Get your health boost and protect yourself against the flu and COVID-19. Find vaccines near you at vaccines.gov. That's vaccines.gov. Signing up for $1 bus and train rides with the Transit Assistance Program, or TAP, is quick and easy. Do it straight from your computer or phone by uploading one of the pre-approved documents listed at metrotransit.org slash TAP, along with a copy of your ID. We'll mail you a go-to card with a full year of discounted rides. For questions or translation help, call 612-373-3333. 612-373-3333. The City of Minneapolis is now on Native Roots Radio with Minneapolis AIR. AIR stands for American Indian Relations. Host Christine McDonald talks to people about important things affecting the city's Native communities. Minneapolis AIR dives into topics like public safety, public health, elections, and so much more. Tune in to Minneapolis AIR on Native Roots Radio from 5 to 6 p.m. on the second Wednesday of every month, right here on AM 950. Unveil the captivating world of Native photography at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Their new exhibit, In Our Hands, Native Photography 1890 to Now, turns the camera around and puts Native photographers in control, featuring hundreds of photographs captured by generations of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and Native Americans. You'll view the world through their lens, revealing the beauty and complexity of Indigenous heritage. Don't miss this incredible experience. Visit In Our Hands at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, now through January 14th. For more info, visit artsmia.org. Hi, this is Representative Sharice Davids from Kansas. I'm Ho-Chunk, and you're listening to Native Roots Radio. And we're back to Native Roots Radio presents I'm Awake, and this is Robert Pilot. Hey, welcome back to Native Roots Radio presents. Uh, just a second here. I have to find out what the name of the show is again. Haley, it's uh, Amer <laughs> Minneapolis, Minneapolis Air. I wanted to see if you were paying attention. Hey, what a great first show, uh, Christine. Um, what great guests and uh, what a way to celebrate uh, Minneapolis, too. And I think uh, just hearing things like there's 130 uh, recognized tribes uh, represented in, this, uh, in the city of Minneapolis, that blew my mind. Also, uh, the roads. Uh, I, I mean, I've learned three or four things already just listening to your show here. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited for what we can bring in the future to this discussion um, and what information we can provide to community. There's a lot going on that people aren't aware of. Like I mentioned, even me growing up in the city of Minneapolis, I didn't know about neighborhood organizations and the opportunity to get involved, nor did I understand how they impacted the community. You know, um, neighborhood organizations have been around for uh, some of them are have been around for 100 years. And we have had uh, intentional work to make sure that those organizations are representative of the neighborhoods and the residents there. Um, and some of the work that's come out of our department has been to help make sure that we have representation on those boards. And I was here um, in the department, when we were able to see um, Native representation seen for the first time at the East Phillips neighborhood 
board. Um, and those were residents out of Little Earth. So there's been a lot of great work done to help make sure that that education and partic participation happens in the public process. Yeah, and I wonder too, if you could explain a little bit more about MUD. And I know we talk uh, a little bit about that on Native Ritz Radio, but I know it was brought up today. And, and maybe our, you can educate our audience and, and Haley and I uh, a little bit more about MUD. Sure. Um, so my, my participation um, is based on my role at the city of Minneapolis. I support the Memor Memorandum of Understanding, which is entered into with the city and the Metropolitan Urban Indian Directors Group. Um, I think a lot of the things that we see happen in our community um, are really a result of what we, we sometimes call the red movement. So around the time when AIM originated. So MUD itself, um, what I was taught was it originated as well about 50 years ago, if not more, around the time when we had an influx of folks moving into the city. A lot of people don't really understand um, or realize that American Indians were also sold the American dream. You know, once uh, we were forced onto reservations, they wanted to continue the assimilation um, and told us, you know, come down to these cities, we'll provide housing for you, we'll make sure your kids are educated, we'll provide work for you. And a lot of times when our people showed up to these urban areas, there, there wasn't anything in place to do that. And so we naturally seen American Indian organizations um, come into place. Um, and as they came into place, they really came and formed a group together to support each other. At that time, a lot of the funding for our programming came out of government entities. A lot of times it's from the city, it's from the county, it's from the state. Um, what I was taught was that they came together to learn how to work with those entities um, and provide services and programs for our community. Um, and so that still happens today. MUD is a collaborative of nonprofit organizations and the leadership from those organizations. So those are, um, those are what are called voting members. And so MUD really is their, um, they, they represent themselves and they represent the community that they serve. So a lot of times the decisions that they make are um, in ways to best serve the community. And uh, they have a monthly meeting where they, the voting members meet. And then there are also seven subcommittees that MUD hosts. And the subcommittees are where we really look to see community participate. Um, we have, um, I can't sure if I can, off the top of my head, there's public safety. We used to have a housing subcommittee, but it now has been um, reprogrammed to be the um, Opioid and Unsheltered Community Crisis Response Committee, um, mm -hmm. Health and Wellness, Employment and Economic Development, Arts and Culture, um, Education, which is really Phillips Indian Educators, as well as family preservation, which that one seems, um, that one is more focused on Indian child welfare. Wow. Hey, we're here with Christine McDonald, and this is a special edition of Native Ritz Radio entitled Minneapolis Air, American Indian Relations. And I thought it was interesting too, and being an old person that I am, I don't mind being called Indian. And, uh, and uh, it was fun that, uh, if it was, I always say if it was good enough for American Indian movement, it's uh, good enough for me to be called that. But it's a process. Uh, words mean a lot. And I'm glad you guys explained uh, the title of the show as well as you did. Yeah, yeah I think um, that was one of the things that I got hit with. I think um, myself, my personal preference is Native. I prefer Native American. <laughs> um, but in one of my first community meetings, there were a couple of people who... Um, didn't agree with the term native. Um, and so they, there was a couple of community people who really gave that support as well as why it should be the American Indian. And I think that really gives the, the city as a government entity, some footing to use that language and stick with it based on the his, historical terminology that's been used. 
Right, right. And I, I think that's important because it's sometimes, you know, uh, for people listening to the show and our, and our Native community and also our white allies to uh, fumble along that, uh, what to call us sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure you go by the same thing that Haley and I do. We prefer being called Ho-Chunk. Mm-hmm. I mean, you yeah. don't, but we do. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a little awkward. But I mean, yeah. 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 Myself. Yeah. Like if you, when I introduce myself, I say I'm Anishinaabe and Hope Papa. Yeah. So even within that, it's mm-hmm. not just the tribe, but the, actually the nation of people that I'm a part of. Yeah, well, I'm excited. Identity, it's more complicated, you know, because like yeah. myself and two. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'm excited to talk about February 17th a little more. And maybe we can get somebody on to talk about that before we have our, our monthly get together, too, on Native Roots Radio. Because uh, uh, at the convention center, I wonder if you can just elaborate a little bit on that with the last couple minutes we have on Absolutely. the show. Absolutely. Thank you for asking that because um, there. We have been doing this conference um, since 2012, and we had only one year, which was COVID, when we weren't able to do the conference. And so um, it's been during my whole duration with the department, and this is the first year that I'm co-lead on it. So I'm happy to be able to talk with it, and I hope next month I'll be able to get my um, my partner, the other co-lead, to be on the show with me as well. Uh, This is a yearly event that brings residents of Minneapolis, community groups, neighborhoods, and local uh, government together. The conference is held at the Minneapolis Convention Center. Um, There's opportunities to be involved as a workshop presenter, exhibitor, or a volunteer. Anyone planning to to apply to be an uh, exhibitor for the conference can do so um, online. At our webpage, you can, it's probably easiest just to search um, City of Minneapolis Community Connections Conference. Um, one thing that um, is really interesting is it's it's grown every year that we haven't been in COVID. So uh, I have invited folks and the folks that I invite, um, you know, when you think of something that the government's going to put on, it's kind of a little like doesn't really sound really exciting. But everybody who has come has really had a good time coming and the lunch is free. The event is free. Um it's cold in, in February, so you might as well come in and get to know people. Absolutely. Hey, I want to say congratulations on uh, uh, co-hosting and uh, doing a great job. Uh, you did a great job and well-prepared and, uh, and great guests, and I can't wait for uh, next month. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity and partnership, Robert. Yeah, we really do, too, and we appreciate all the work you've done over the years for our our Native people in the city of Minneapolis. Hey, you were listening to Minneapolis Air, which is uh, Minneapolis Indian Relations, uh, supported by Native Roots Radio. Uh, We'll be back tomorrow. We're still here. We are the seventh generation. And free Leonard Peltier. Now. Now. J&S Bean Factory is a Native-owned, community-supported, cozy, artsy, 